Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. I'm back to working on my simple amateur radio receiver project and up till now I've shown a lot of the individual elements and a lot of the simulations, but is the whole thing going to work when it's put together? Well, in today's episode, we're going to find out. All right, the main PC board has arrived. Actually, I got five of them. That's pretty much the minimum order quantity for most of the overseas fab shops. And it turned out great. Naturally, I have to have my Level Up Double E Lab logo on the board. As much as I enjoy making my own boards, sometimes it's just a treat to have legitimate through-hole vias, solder mask, silk screening, and all that good stuff. Here's a little preview of it fitting inside the case. I'm planning to bias it towards the back of the case to leave as much room as possible in the front for the potentiometers and other front panel controls. Looks like there should be just enough space for all of that stuff. And here it is, all populated. I did start the assembly with the reverse voltage FET and voltage regulator and powered them up to make sure I had good 5 volts before moving forward. Next, I fully populated the SMT side and then soldered in all the relays, sockets, transformers, and then the nano. Looking here at the SMT side, there are a few items that stand out. First, the SI5351 and MAX4820 modules are easy to find. Also, I still have to remove the RA flux residue before placing it in the enclosure. And do note the ground wire strap I soldered to the three crystals. That's always a good practice. All in all, I'd say I'm pleased with how it turned out, and I definitely made the right choice not to etch this board myself. And speaking of etching, the other items that I finished populating were all of the 10 bandpass filters. If you remember from one of my earlier episodes, I had a streak of bad luck with trying to make those little boards myself, and I just gave up and ordered them. Well, no surprise, they turned out great too. Here's what one looks like as compared to one of the better ones that I made. Now I did have around 20 toroids that I had to wind for the inductors for these filters, and these T30s are the smallest ones. You can see the bigger T50s and the jumbo T68s on the filters in the background. I use a pretty common technique to wind the larger cores. You need something to support the toroid and provide stability, so a tapered pin clamped in a vise works very well. I do wrap the pin with electrical tape that keeps the pin from abrading the wire enamel. Be careful not to lose count of the turns as you go. Myself, I count them out loud. That helps me keep track. And another good practice is to wind one more turn than you need, just in case your calculations might be off. The enamel on the wire has to be removed so that you get bare copper for the solder to stick to. You can get winding wire that has heat strippable insulation, but I'm old school. The wire I have has to be scraped. It's not that difficult. You can use a cheap utility knife and it works well. Now, scraping 28 gauge or smaller wire, that starts to get a bit dicey, but for 24 gauge or larger like I'm using here, scraping it's not that hard. Once I finished the toroids, the rest of the assembly went pretty fast. These here are the trimmer caps that I'm using on the Butterworth filters. They're in parallel with the fixed COG caps, and with the trimmer in approximately mid-range, the combined parallel capacitance equaled my spreadsheet calculated value. Of course, having an alligator clip vise or a PC board vise is pretty much mandatory when working on small through-hole soldered boards. So here's the finished 12 meter filter as an example. And just like the receiver board, I used RA flux and it has to be removed. Fortunately, because the boards are so small, I can easily use my favorite technique, which is an old coffee mug, a couple tablespoons of lacquer thinner, and a flux brush. This technique works very well. Now, there are some SMT devices that aren't compatible with solvents like lacquer thinner and you have to be careful, but the vast majority of SMT devices are not harmed by it, and it doesn't damage even the run-of-the-mill solder mask and silk screen that I have here. The last item to make for the 10 filters are the 3D printed clips. I need 20 of them and each one takes about 90 minutes for the printer to spit out and so far I've only made about half of them. But I am pretty happy with how this idea turned out. They add a lot of protection to the board and give a better feature to grab them by when installing or removing them. Attaching them to the filter board requires a couple of number 3 screws and nuts. 
I use this trap nut approach a lot for assembling 3D printed parts that works much better than threading screws directly into the PLA resin. In my day job I've designed quite a few plastic parts that are assembled using the common PT style threaded fasteners and they do work very well. But those are injection molded parts that are made from engineered polymers like polyamide and polyester and those make much tougher screw bosses than you can get from PLA. Anyway, here's an example of a finished filter. All it needs now is to be tuned for optimal performance. And to do that tuning, I'm going to use my home-built spectrum analyzer. Alright, here we go. It's time to tune these filters and get them dialed in to the design nominal condition. So what I've got set up here will look familiar to you folks that have been keeping up with my channel. Here's my uh, homemade spectrum analyzer, of course, and my trusty 465. That's the display for the SA. And here's another uh, usual character, my HP signal generator. And this guy is a relatively uh, new uh, featured item in my lab. This is the electronic switch that I built. And there are two episodes that I made on the design and construction of this device. Essentially, what this is, it lets me multiplex two signals back and forth onto the display coming out of the spectrum analyzer. And I need that because as good as my SA is, as good as it is with the um, discipline for the log per you know 10 dB uh, per division on the scope, I have no way of really knowing what the frequency is. That's why I designed this so I can multiplex my HP, which is very accurate to frequency, and I can see where particular phenomena coming out of the SA are relative to frequency. And that'll be very good for, for tuning this filter, as we'll see. So to get this started, I've got the 20, 20 meter filter set up in a little test PC board that I made here. Essentially, this is just replicating the sockets that'll be on the receiver main board, and I just plug in the receiver mod, uh, the filter module rather. I don't have the plastic bracket, but no worry. And because this is relatively low frequency, we're in the HF region. As long as I don't have my fingers on the board and certainly fingers on the toroids, I'm not going to adversely affect the filter with stray capacitance. So just holding it in my hand is is not an issue. So to get this going, what I need to do is set the center frequency for the filter, which according to my master sheet here is 14.1 megahertz. So 14.1 megahertz and turn on the RF power. There's the signal. Turn the brightness up a little bit. Pay no attention to that guy. That's the zero spur artifact that's in the SA. So what I can do then is tune in set the, the range and tune the frequency to put that 14.1 megahertz signal right about center screen. Um, I am on my 300 kilohertz resolution filter, so it's pretty broad. That's fine for running uh, this, this uh, adjustment. So what I'll do now, I'll turn on the tracking generator and we can see on screen uh, back and forth. That's not uh, true simultaneous signals. It's a uh, multiplex, so it's switching back and forth between uh, the HP and the spectrum analyzer output. But this is the technique that uh, you would use to tune a filter like this. I have the two adjustable caps, and what I'm going to do is just adjust those to put that peak response right on that center frequency. And you can see, since it's a double-tuned circuit filter, this cap is adjusting the peak of one side and then this cap is adjusting the other one and I get those aligned and I don't have to be super precise here if I go a little too far I can always go back and just tweak these back and forth and of course I'm using a non-metallic tool to do this and that's pretty good so for sure, I could dial this in even more precisely on a network analyzer but for this kind of work this is all that's needed, and it's actually even more than it's really needed. You could do this with a, a simple power meter and a signal generator, but certainly having the spectrum analyzer with the tracking generator makes this a lot easier. All right, here we go. I've got the receiver set up, and just to do a quick walk around, I did have to add the audio frequency board and then all the controls that go with the receiver. So I have the notch filter, the, the crystal filter, the IF gain, and the AF gain pots all connected. A speaker, of course, and I've got some jumper wires going just to my 40-meter antenna outside. 
that usually gives very strong signals. And then of course the display and the two encoders are connected. So I do have the software set up right now to default to the um, FT8 frequency. So let's turn it on. And there they are, pretty much 24 seven. You're gonna find some activity on 40 meters for uh, FT8. All right, now let me tune up band here on 40 meters and see if I can find some single sideband activity. Oh, turn the volume back up. All right, it's working. I don't want to record too much of the fellow hams communicating there, but one of the things that I've had to adjust is the BFO frequency, and I do have it pretty well dialed in for lower sideband. I'm going to have to work on it for uh, upper sideband and get it where I want for CW, but the radio is working. Now, one last comment here on uh, the progress to date. Now, this is, clearly wasn't a live demo, you know, not the first time that I've powered this up. I had a real problem for the last week or so with getting this to work. And as it turns out, it wasn't a mistake or an oversight on my part. It actually was a bug in a lot of the um, SI5351 libraries that are out there. And make a long story short for now, I did find it. I fixed it. It's cl clearly working now. But I will cover it in more detail in my next episode so you can see what the issue was and how I fixed it. But setting that aside, I'm very happy that it's working right now. And in a future episode as well, I'll show some of the tuning steps I'm going to do because there are four adjustments to make here on the audio board. I don't have the S meter hooked up yet. That's another thing to, to dial in. And of course, I want to show some of the other bands working. But all in all, great project, and I'm pleased with where it is. So that's it for today's episode. It's always a great feeling to get to this point in a project where things are working and now you're just into the fine tuning and dialing in stage and everything else is basically gravy from this point out. Now I will have a lot of material yet to cover. I have, After I finish all the alignment, I still have to do the mechanical construction and get it all finished in the enclosure I'm planning to use. And I did receive the new vacuum tube for my EUW15 um, power supply. So I'll be popping that in this week and trying it out and hopefully that fixes is that issue as well. So as always, thanks very much for watching. I appreciate you for, for tuning in and watching the, the fun I'm having in my electronics laboratory. So until next time, bye for now.